All right, so I wanna welcome everyone again. Um, we're gonna be doing a part two of our series of how to be successful in the music industry. Um, really excited about this topic. Uh, we're gonna definitely, this particular subject, we're gonna be talking about sustainability within a virtual world. Obviously, you know, COVID has kind of impacted everyone's lives. So I'm very happy to um, speak to our special guest today. Um, let's kind of go through the agenda real quick and kind of some of the topics that we'll be covering and then we'll kind of let our special guests introduce themselves and tell them a little bit about your, about themselves. So first, we'll be learning the meaning of career, uh, music career sustainability uh, and the elements creators must focus on to create a sustainable career for themselves, um, what, kind of what that looks like. Um, also, we kind of want to discuss how sustainability has shifted again, in this new virtual world and um, what that means for the artists in the next few years and how that kind of will impact you guys' careers. Um, and then we wanna get firsthand experience just with special guests um, to talk about, you know, from industry experts on how to set up themselves for success and learn what to avoid if you want to stand out from the rest, you know, from the pack, whether you're a producer, artist, or a songwriter. So without further ado, um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself and I'll turn over the stage to Emily and Julia. But uh, for me, I go by the name of Woot, Woot Johnson. Um, I kind of had, well, I don't kind of, I had the <laughs> ANR uh, initiatives here for Song Trust in the Atlanta area, also for the Southeast area, but pretty much worldly. Um, outside of Song Trust, my day-to-day -day job, I kind of had the ANR management um, for a label called the Upper Class Music Group, uh, founded by Grammy Award winning producers AO and Key. So, also manage producers, one artist, and two songwriters at this point. Uh, so, that's a little bit about me, but I want to definitely turn it over to our special guest. Uh, first up, we'll introduce Emily, uh, again, renowned author. Um, she's partner of the Collective Entertainment and founder of iVoter. So, Emily, just give the people who are attending a quick 35 second spill of who you are, how you got started, and why we're we here today. Yeah, I, I can't do that in 35 seconds, but thank you, Woo. Um, you did a great job. Um, yeah, I'm a founding partner at Collective Entertainment, where we manage Julia amongst um, additional amazing artists. And uh, yeah, I'm the founder of the I Voted Festival. That was just the largest digital concert in history. Um, breaking news, we're actually ramping up to do I Voted Again for Georgia on, on January 5th, so stay tuned for that. And I'm the author of uh, How to Build a Sustainable Music Career and Collect All Revenue Streams, as well as Interning 101. Um, I got my, my start is, or, you know, my start is way too long to talk about, but definitely through internships. I met a band called the Dresden Dolls, worked at a management company, worked at Live Nation Artists, started my first entertainment firm in 2008. Um, yeah, so that's the very consolidated version. Amazing. I love it. We'll kind of unpack that as we kind of talk throughout the conversation tonight. Um, so next up, we have another, our second uh, special guest, Julia. Kind of let the people know a little bit about yourself, um, some of your works, and just kind of talk about who you are and kind of how we made it here today. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. I love seeing everyone introducing themselves in the chat box. Hello from all of these places. Um, I'm a musician, a songwriter, I sing, and I've been doing that on the internet for like 15 years, and music has been my only job ever. And That's I amazing. <laughs> People work to... Uh... To, to, to be able to do music full time. So that's that's a big accomplishment. We're not gonna kind of just shy over that and just kind of make it seem like it's very small. So amazing. But again, we'll get into you guys' story as we talk. Without further ado, let's kind of hop right into our first topic, um, what everybody's here for, music career sustainability. So first up, um, I would love to ask you guys, let's unpack, you know, what does music career sustainability mean to you? And what's your opinion on that? What does that mean to you? Uh, Emily, I'll kind of let you start first and then Julia, you can kind of echo uh, Emily. I'm so excited about this because I have my thoughts and I feel like Julia's thoughts will be different, but not to <laughs> anticipate that. So um, the Cliff's Notes version of how to build a sustainable music career and collect all revenue streams is basically like why are tech companies the most valuable companies in the world? Because they have all of our data, right? They have our email addresses, our phone numbers, and locations. And as musicians and music industry people, we tend to just give that data away to Spotify, to iTunes, um, MySpace, Friendster, if you're old enough to remember that, right? Like the social networks and the tech platforms keep moving on. Um, so for me, sustainability 
uh, in the music industry comes down to one, uh, making great art. That's chapter one. I like, I do feel that anyone can have a career in the modern music industry, but you have to be making great art. Um, that's really, really important. Um, you have to connect with your fans. Um, you know, for me at the basic level, that's email list, text message club, and, and, and social media, but knowing where your fans are, which is even valuable um, in pandemic times, right? Like you could do a virtual tour of like, okay, we're going to do a webcast at Hotel Cafe in LA, and then we're going to do a fundraiser with Rockwood in, in New York and, you know, do a cover that's more like specific to those cities. Um, so really like my point is sustainability in the music industry at its core is um, artists and their team members collecting fan data so we can communicate with you guys directly. And to me, that comes in the form of email addresses, uh, text message, you know, phone numbers, uh, mobile phone numbers for text messages and, uh, and knowing where you all are, both for touring and non-touring reasons. Amazing, amazing, I love it. And we'll kind of, my next question, we'll kind of, we'll kind of dive deep into that. So we'll turn it over to Julia. Um, for you, what's your opinion? What does uh, music career sustainability mean for you as a songwriter and artist? Yeah, I love Emily's answer because it's like totally the manager side of it. Um, well, and then like for me on the creation side, I think that um, getting into a rhythm, like learning yourself is the biggest thing. If you're trying to create, you need to learn yourself. So some artists create best when they remove all distractions and completely like fall up in a place for one week and just like slam it out. And some musicians work best slowly chipping away at it at two in the morning every single night forever and ever with a day job. And like, um, you can really only learn yourself by experiencing the parts of your life where you don't create. And then you're like, what, what is missing? Like try on different schedules and different um, ways of creating and then figure out when you actually put stuff out. Because when I had all of the time in the world, I did not put stuff out. But when I had crunch time, when I had a lot going on, when I was on tour, I had other obligations, then all of a sudden my creativity would happen because I was like creating while I was on a walk or creating while I was doing something else. And I valued the time that I had to create. So it's not, it won't be what you expect. You have to like try it on. Amazing. I just want to add quickly. Um, so I taught management at NYU last year and I had the students present um, on their final project on what a sustainable music career meant to them. And shout out to my student, Jack Hansen. He gave like the most inspirational presentation ever about mental health. He was like, if you're not taking care of, you know, your mental and physical health, how are you going to create art? How are you going to be effective, an effective industry person? So um, although my initial answer is very technical, that I will never forget that presentation at the same time. Absolutely. I think mental health is important. You know, obviously COVID impacted everybody in their own right way. Um, some people went depressed, you know, jobs, everything was just alarming. So definitely mental health is important, especially from a creative standpoint. I mean, you guys are inspired to, that's how you guys become creative, you know, just being in a good space, um, seeing different things, traveling the world, whatever that means for you. So I definitely uh, think mental health is definitely, I hope he, he, uh, he received the A on that. Definitely process. A plus on that one. Right. <laughs> so that leads to the next question. You know, Emily, you talked about art, you talked about email tracking. Um, Julie, you kind of mentioned, um, you know, just being able to be in the right space. So let's kind of unpack, you know, what are some factors that drive success? And then also on the flip side of that, what are some things that can deter success from being um, sustainable? So uh, Julie, I'll let you start first and then we'll kind of flip it over to Emily. Uh, like just expanding on like what, what the circumstances? Right, what are some factors that will drive, you know, success uh, to be a creative? What are some factors? So, so one thing to try on and see like uh, how you work is like, are you better alone or with people? And that's a big question. Like, and, and uh, you don't just solve it in like one experiment with one group of people or one person. Like you need to figure out if you like working with introverts or you like working with people who are really forceful with their ideas or you like working with people who can goof off and you guys are also friends or you like working with people that 
are dead serious and like the second you get in the room you're like writing and working and and um it's really like finding the circumstance under which you will thrive is like keep going until you find it <laughs> that's my best advice like don't stop until you're like i like the way this feels and that's like when i found my um bandmate and collaborator chase burnett i was like everything just got so much easier i was getting stuck alone i was getting like hung up on certain things and i thought i didn't like working with people because i would get stressed out in other situations so when you find that fit the work becomes less work because it just is innate to you. So people is a huge category. I could keep going, but let me know. No, amazing. Um, I, honestly, what I just took from that is making sure the energy in the room and, and the collaborative that you're working with is, you know, that's essential to being able to create, you know, being able to create your best work, just having the right people around you to inspire you to bring other things out of it. Um, so, you know, for, Emily, for you, you know, from the business management side, what are some factors um, that drive success and what are some things that can deter success from your view? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I think is applicable to both artists and industry people. Um, I feel very strongly about listening to one's intuition um, and really just being true to yourself and being genuine. And I feel really strongly about that in music. Um, I, I'm sure you experience this all the time, Woot, but you know, I have artists always sending me their music, like wanting my feedback or saying like, I think it's great for this label. Or I'm like, did you write it for that label? Like, did, who cares what I think, you know? Cause it goes back to what I said initially. I think anyone can have a legitimate music career, like if the music is awesome. So I've always worked with like, I, I love what I love. You know, I'm not necessarily lis listening for like a, a traditional hit song. It's like, if I love something and I connect with it, then I know other people will too. And then it's about cultivating that fan base and growing it and taking care of those fans. Um, I would say certainly on the business end and I'm sure on the artist end too, just leaving space in your schedule a little bit, you know, like I told a couple people today, like, you know, that wanted to set up calls. I'm like, I just can't right now, you know, like, can I let you know when I come up for air? Because I want to be present for Julie. I want to be present for this. Like, you know, at, in my younger days, I would schedule, you know, six, seven conference calls a day or what, whatever. And now it's like all block off days with no conference calls. So I can be creative as a business person and I have the, the mental space to take care of what, what I need to. So yeah, just, just making sure that you take that time and space so you can be mindful in your interactions um, with, with everyone, let alone business folks. Absolutely. Um, Julia, I want to ask you this question before we go to the next question, because you kind of talked about just in a songwriter space. So what what's some advice you would give, you know, just as far as, you know, as a songwriter, you're in a session with another artist. So you're there to deliver, you know, a song for them. How important is energy in the room? How does how should a songwriter approach that situation? Yeah, I think the energy in the room is so important. And one of the best tools I have for that is vulnerability. Mm. Like. I've been in sessions before where it felt like weird and off a little bit. And then I just say like, man, I'm nervous. I, <laughs> I feel intimidated like this. You, you are so talented and I, I feel intimidated. And then just like getting your true self out into the room, kind of like what Emily said, like being authentic it bursts the, the bubble of like weird performativeness mm -hmm. because when you're making the art, like we, we all think that performing art is like a big part of it. I, I'm a performer, but that's actually like once you've done the, the deep work of like getting it up and out. Um, so being able to drop down a few layers into um, almost like, like deep friendship when you're making art with someone. It's like a connection on, on a level that, that it's hard to explain, but it feels like really intimate. And so you need to treat it with that reverence for how intimate it is. Right, and last thing before we move on, this is still for you, Julia. Um, what should the approach be, right? So obviously you as a songwriter, if, if a label camp reaches out to you to come in to, you know, do a record for artists. 
for artists, they obviously believe in your work, your art that you create. What is the approach? Do you, should you come in and be the leader in the room or should you kind of let the artist take control in that situation to just kind of, you know, balance their energy? What, what is the approach? Um, I think it's a matter of trusting yourself. Like okay. if, if what's happening in the room uh, feels good to you, then you can trust that like you can kick back and, and hear these people that you're trusting. You know, you're trusting yourself to be with these people that are um, fitting with your vision. But if if the conversation starts to go in a direction or it starts to become like out of congruence with what you can or want to do, then speaking up as soon as possible. Like, and and that's actually like so much harder than than uh, I want it to be. But uh, the sooner you do it, the better. Um, I think a lot of artists, because we're so good at taking in information and muddling it around and putting it back out as art, we get into that situation and we start just taking it all in and forget to like immediately respond. So noticing that really helps me be like, oh, I need to like be more in the moment in a meeting. Okay, amazing, amazing. So moving on to the next question, Emily, I'll let you start with this. Um, and we're still on the same topic. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously we're in a world right now where, you know, I feel like this generation, we attach success to IG, um, social media fame. We attach, you know, success to um, streaming numbers. So Emily, um, how should creators start to define success for themselves? Um, email list numbers, text message, club numbers, you know, like, um, it, it's interesting, like, I, I've been seeing some things actually on social media that, um, you know, I've been hearing for years, which is like, you know, I'd rather have uh, a thousand pan, a thousand pans pay a hundred dollars a year, you know, and make a hundred grand than have a hundred thousand followers and make a hundred dollars a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, I happened to speak with Image and Heap today. I, I interviewed her for a podcast that I'm putting out on my new book. And, um, I asked her about growth because chapter 11 of my book is repeat and grow. It's like, okay, go through everything we just taught you and then repeat and grow. But for some, someone at that level, I'm like, do you think about growth? And she's like, not really, you know, like she's, she has her own app with her fans and is releasing music that way. And she's hanging out with them in there. And she's like, the fan base is growing. Like the word continues to spread. Um, but I, I found that to be really interesting. And I think it goes back to kind of what I said earlier. It's just like, I've always built businesses around an artist. You know, I've always done that and taken care of fans a very close second. And to me, that's everything. Um, second and third only to creating great art. But again, it's like, there are people with like amazing A&R ears. Like we all know them. I am not one of those people. I cannot tell you what's gonna be played on the radio, but I can tell you what I connect with, you know, emotionally and what resonates with me. And like I said, if that's the case with me, obviously it's the case with, with other people. And, um, you know, Julie and I haven't worked together for that long, but we've, we've had very similar paths. Um, and yeah, I think we've just been all about, you know, taking care of the fans, growing that. Um, and, and that's the case in like everything, right? Like it's not just music, it's like TV shows or gaming or whatever. Like we live in this infinite world of content so people are going to be into, you know, what they're into. Like we just experienced that at I Voted. Like we booked artists per the data relatively quick. Um, there is a group, uh, one of the top streaming artists in Wisconsin is Red Hot Chili Pipers. Um, and I had to hear from people uh, in the industry all summer, like, oh, there's a typo on your website. And I'm like, no, my mom goes to Irish Fest in Milwaukee every year. And I have to hear about how great the Red Hot Chili Pipers are. I just looked at our stats and at, at over 500 artists performing on election night, Red Hot Chili Pipers were number 23. Wow. So it's like, the data doesn't lie. I'm all about what fans are into and not necessarily like what we as the industry think people should be into, if that makes sense. Right, absolutely. Absolutely, I understand. Um, so Julia, for you, um, like I said, people attach success to just different things, depending on what they're into um, from an artist's perspective. Um, what, what is your advice? What should, uh, should creators start to define this success for themselves? 
what does that look like? Yeah, I think success for me is is being able to make a a living that feels um, sustainable, like what we're talking about here. Um, because uh, I forget who said this, but someone was like, "You can't make art when you're trying to make a living." And if if all of your um, and I've been in in places in my life like this where like my livelihood depended on like I have to make the art and there has been no less productive time in my life. I was just panicked. And um, so like living at a level where I can afford my life with the money that's coming in from music and having that be like a good life, that's success. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. Um, I'm going to pull a quick Q&A from someone that asked. I think this is a good question because we're on a topic. Um, and Emily, you may have more insight and Julie, you can add on as well. Um, someone asked, what are some resources available that can help better establish sustainability? What are some resources? Um, I'm not trying to sell books, but that is why I wrote this new I don't book. Know. <laughs> and I'd like, in all seriousness, like to hear Julia talk about that, like that, this is why I thought of that. Like, when I started working with Julia, I was like, what's your publishing situation? I hope this is okay to say. You were like, I don't have one. And I was like, what? You're like a national established artist. So there's a huge revenue stream that you're missing. So we signed her up for Song Trust. We've been thrilled, thrilled with that, honestly. Um, and I, I, I basically like created, and this is in the book, so you guys can all do this too. I created a Google spreadsheet for Julia that was a revenue spreadsheet. So I have a blank you know, Google spreadsheet link version, you know, that you all can use in there. Basically to one, project her monthly and annual income, but two, which I almost felt was more important, was to see if there were any holes, see if there were any missing revenue streams. And I, I, I did find some. Um, I was really horrified. I, I don't mean to like freak people out, but I was really horrified when Julia told me that, um, I won't even say what category this is in, but someone called me and said, oh, we have a five figure check we owe you. And I was like, is there a statement? Is there any information, you know? So if you look at this spreadsheet, it's a little cumbersome to get going, but I, I have heard from artists that they really love it. So that makes me really happy. Um, you literally can project your monthly and annual income based on uh, your catalog. And then, like I said, if there's a blank column you're missing revenue. <laughs> so um, yeah, the, I, this was stuff that like every musician that I come across like wants to get coffee and wants to like pick my brain about. And I just was having the same conversations over and over. So I'm like, I'm going to write this down. I'll give it to people. I don't care. Um, I just, I just felt like if, if Julia was missing revenue and we took on another national act at that time, exact same situation. So I'm like, if this is happening to artists people have heard of, what about everybody else? Amazing. Go ahead, Julie. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that like I wanted to say this earlier too. When it comes to like people that you work with, like the business side is just as important. Like you might genuinely be a person that that can't your brain fries when you try to read Emily's book, and and it's like easy. It's an easy book. <laughs> she really lays it out like plainly and it's short and it's like it makes it all very clear my brain literally fries when i when i try to look at it and so finding someone who um like the same as you can't be panicked about money being panicked about that side of things you kind of have two choices like either be like all right i'm gonna learn this book and and like really get familiar with this or be like, all right, I literally have no interest in that. And I need to find someone who can understand these things and mm -hmm. work with me. And I saw some people in the chat were like, I need a good manager like Emily. And then there's also people who are like, I'm getting this book. Like there's matches made in heaven, you know? There's people that need an Emily and there are people that can read <laughs> and understand Emily's book. Right. <laughs> I think you bring up some really good points though. Like if, if reading this stuff like is torture, which I totally get, um, like it, it's also a mindset and it's a mentality. So it's like, honestly, like this is not just because I manage Julia, like pay attention to how Julia does things, you know, like Julia has been releasing a song a month this year on the first of every month, a song and a video. Um, so when the pandemic 
happened, um, which was so awful for touring and so many things and so many reasons. I mean, Julia, you have like immense compassion for everything that's been going on, but I feel like our team was kind of like, okay, is it the first of the month yet? Is it time to release another song? You know? So again, it's, it's a mentality. So if, if, um, reading a book sounds like hell to you and I, it makes me sad to say that not, not my book, but reading a book. Um, but I get it. Um, yeah, pay attention to what Julia is doing. Pay attention to what Zoe Keating is doing. Pay, pay attention to what Imogen Heap is doing, because again, it's a men mentality. Um, there's an artist I just met through, I voted per the data, um, called Kala. And he's another one where I'm like, which I don't say often, I'm like, you're doing everything right. Keep, keep doing it. And he just launched a fundraiser for his album. He's released an album every year since he was 15. He's working on his 15th album for half his life. And he said other artists like want to hire him to teach him how to do this stuff. And he's like, it's a fundraiser. Anyone can run a fundraiser, you know? So he, ne he didn't initially read my book, but he has that mentality. So like I said, if, if reading this stuff sounds like torture, pay attention to these artists who, you know, that's very kind what you said, Julia, but you and I are on the same page, even if you're doing it and I'm writing it, you know? Amazing, amazing. And staying on topic, um, this is another Q&A question. I think it, it, it deals with what we're talking about. Um, being that you guys are a team, right? You know, you manage Julia. Um, someone asks, at what point should we consider adding others to their team to keep their career sustainable? At what point? Like, what's the significant point in their career? Should they start thinking about adding more elements to their team to grow? Any preference on who goes first? Julia, you can go first. Go ahead. <laughs> it looks like you're still thinking, but no pressure. <laughs> I, I do. Have, I have a thought, um, which is, so, right, I've been a musician for 15 years, um, and I remember being young and uh, kind of freaking out about managers and being approached uh, and while I even had a manager and was kind of like, what do I do? And um, I consulted like one of my idols and was lucky enough to like be on tour with him at the time, uh, Ben Folds. I was like, this manager, this manager, team, ah, record labels. And he was like, Julia, no advancement in my career has ever been due to the business side. Mm. So the, speaking strictly from the artist side, the art is the only thing that you really need to worry about. And then when it comes, like the timing of it, like it'll come when it comes, but stressing out about the business side, like, ugh. It's just never, it's never the time to stress about like, I need a label, I need a manager. It's like, no, you need to, you need to take care of yourself. You need to make art and you need to like keep going day by day. Okay. And then that manager that comes at that right time will be the one. And I, I just wanna, before Emily talks, cause I think you have like a totally different perspective on it, but like, Emily approached me about a year before we started working together. And I was just like, not in a place to go hard on music at that point. Like I was fresh off of a breakup and I just didn't feel able. And then once I got the music going, I reached back out and we started working together. It's always, always about the art. Amazing, perfect time. And then Emily, I'll kind of turn it over to you um, to kind of echo. Julie, what's yeah. it's what's such an interesting question. It's the last chapter of my book. And it's also the first chapter of Don Passman's book, who is kind enough to give me a blurb on mine. Um, I also inter interviewed him relatively recently. And uh, I so I reread his most recent version. And you know, that initially came out in 1991. So I understand if you're writing the ultimate music business book in 1990 or whatever, like, yeah, chapter one is gotta assemble a team, right? It's the pre-digital world. Um, but yeah, it's the last chapter in my book for a reason, because you can use all of these great tools, Song Trust is heavily featured in chapter five, um, to move forward, right? And then is the time to assemble a team. I feel like the time to assemble a team is um, when, you, when you can't do the work anymore, which is different from not wanting to do the work. Um, but again, it was really interesting to talk to Imogen today. Uh, she does not have a manager, although she did for a long time. And he was very good. Um, 
but she was really excited to share the team she does have. She's like, well, this person runs my studio and this person kind of runs the house and this is my personal assistant. And um, same when I talked to Zoe Keating about the same things. I mean, she is the ultimate person that does not need to read my book. Like she, she was like, I like all the revenue streams you you list, but you can break them down further and go a little bit more direct and collect on mechanicals direct. I'm like, they don't even know what mechanical royalties are yet. So we're teaching them how to collect on their publishing, how to collect on all these revenue streams. And then Zoe, you and I can write the advanced placement version uh, at some point when you all master this first. Um, but my point is Zoe, um, I guess I was kind of surprised because she is so good at doing everything herself. and. Um, she has a film scoring agent who's also her sync agent because she didn't want to stress when sync requests came in. She's a single widowed mom. So she's like, I don't want to miss out on anything if I'm not sitting on email 24 seven. Um, she has an attorney because uh, a lot of times it sounded like dance and ballet companies use her music all the time without licenses and she didn't know what to do. So now she's like, my attorney sends a letter. It's great. Uh, she also doesn't do her own taxes, right? And she's like, and her point was, she's like, you know, even if you're doing as much as possible yourself and that's your mentality, like the bits that you're pushing off and procrastinating on, which for her was accounting, she's like, I'm happy to pay my accountant. I'm happy to pay my attorney. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that's what's really empowering about the modern era. It's not just like, okay, let's get a manager. Let's get whatever. I mean, again, not to be arrogant, like the amount of industry people and like huge managers I see buying this new book like is mind blowing. So like, you're also working with people that are still figuring out the digital era and how all this stuff works, right? Like we're all figuring it out together. Um, but yeah, the more you can empower yourself, the better. And, and there are a lot of great folks like, like Song Trust, honestly, can, continuing to try to simplify this information for you because it was set up decades ago before most of us were alive in like the 1950s to confuse artists, right? So. I've tried to simplify all that information, but there are people like Imogen and Future of Music, like literally trying to reshape it. So people don't have to read my book. Like Julia said, it's just like, it just makes sense. Absolutely, I love it. And I and you, I think you said it perfectly. Like, I think it's set, the music industry was set up to make it difficult to figure out how to collect. I'm not sure why that's such a secret world uh, about publishing, but the fact that, you know, you're, you're giving creatives the opportunity to kind of just outline, hey, this is what you need to collect. Um, and how you go about collecting is amazing. So continue to, you know, could, to do the good work and so on trust, we'll continue to kind of have our platform for individuals to be able to collect their back end publishing. So uh, with that being said, let's take it to the next topic. Um, we want to go into more so of sustainability in a virtual world. Obviously, we have new apps and social media networks that are popping up daily um, to give creators more opportunities to get their music heard. So First question, um, how has the understanding of success and sustainability changed over the last year with virtual becoming the main form of engagement? Um, so Julia, I'll kind of let you answer that. Like just as of lately, how do you think, you know, the virtual world has changed um, and how's the understanding of success sustainability changed for that? Yeah, the my revenue stream needs to be like 50% um, touring and merch sales on tour. Mm -hmm. um so it's actually like still the recalibration process of like what what will work for me and um and what works for my fans like what do my fans actually want um mm -hmm. and so i was already doing a song a month and mm -hmm. um it was really like an experiment for me to get songs that have been stuck in me out mm -hmm. um, and it just resonated with people and it was like a, a different vibe for me as well like I've been pretty acoustic in my career and this was way more like bedroom lo-fi pop and um, and it resonated with people and it felt like okay we could like this is sustainable for me I can do this once a month times in my life that I've put, put like a huge project on myself and given myself a year to do it just didn't work it was like too much pressure the project was too big and I had too long to do it and so it didn't happen. so once a month one song a month like okay I can handle that 
now that that system is set up, like what can I add to that? So in our meetings um, with Emily, like we talk about maybe in 2021, I can do a merch item a month along with this song. And that like for me then brings in the question and this speaks to the last one, like, all right, I don't think I can design a merch item every month. So because I have this thing that's sustainable, I'm not gonna panic if I need to add this one other thing on as long as I find that like perfect merch person to work with. And I know my fans well enough from tour. So, so kind of like apply the old world to the new world of like, my fans always love my merch. I feel like when I would go to shows, I would be like, I would be in the merch line. We'd be like, we love each other's style. Like you are wearing merch of mine from five years ago and you cropped it. And it's like so much cooler now. <laughs> and then I like come out with a crop top and it's like such a, um, it's like a fun thing for me to put my attention on that. It's like a different way of creating for me. So if merch is something that works for your fans and works for you, then that's like an amazing way to carry into this like socially distanced life. And then um, I wanna say, I'm hearing a lot about online shows like Zoom shows with small like capped crowds of like 20 to 30 mm -hmm. with more expensive tickets and then like one-on-one -on -one conversations where you get to like do a little Q&A in the middle of your show, which is a lot like what I used to do in living room shows. So you can just like apply stuff that worked before that you like doing, that your people like when you do and try some stuff on. Amazing, I love it. Uh, Emily, I'm not sure if you had anything to echo her, but I did have, a, I have another question for you that I wanted to ask you. Did you have anything? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just echo quickly. Yeah, it's like, you do what you can with the things that are around you. So um, Julia had like a million uh, custom Julia Noons ukuleles in the merch store's warehouse this year. Um, I, I'm sh I think the merch company brought this up because they're like, we are we have all these ukuleles. We don't know what to do with them. I, I don't know who gets credit for this idea, probably them. Um, but we did a flash sale a few months ago and sold out of all the ukuleles. <laughs> So I was like, why don't we just do this all the time? Let's go through the merch store. Like, um, I don't know if we ended up doing this, but just for example, it's like Julia had a shirt that just says feelings. And I was like, why don't we ship you one? Get, have fun, get creative with the feelings shirt if you want to cut it up or not, or whatever you want to do, you know? Um, and same with our I Voted initiative. You know, in 2018, we activated over 150 venues to let fans in on election night who showed a selfie from outside their polling place. Well, that went out the window with the pandemic, right? So it was a no brainer to me to pivot to webcast, just like you all are um, as artists, right? So we're all creative people. You have to take what's around you and, and make something of it, if you can. Amazing, I love it. Um, I think that's great advice. Um, it kind of leads me to my next question. Like right now, obviously, like I said, COVID has impacted everyone. Um, and so what was you guys advice being that we're in such uncertainty right now when the industry will, will return to normal? Um, what is some advice like how can creators prepare themselves for long term if this is going to be for virtual success if this is going to be a thing for the next year or two? And Julia, you can start first. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I think that actually paying attention to the young people mm -hmm. is is like the humbling move. Um, the, the kids that are like 15, 16 now are, have been like raised on the internet and it's like not that crazy to connect with people, really connect with people on the internet. And, um, and it's not that crazy that the weird, weird thing that you do that is so specific and in, in your hometown and maybe even in your friend group was like strange and unwelcome would be welcome in a niche on the internet. Like my advice is get as specific as you actually are hmm. and then be that online and be that often. Like there is, there is 
a new format emerging that is like small clips of frequent content and that that is how things are building. And, and I also, I wanna to speak to the fact that like, I have a lot of privilege and um, like, what is it like seniority almost? Like I already have a fan base. I'm not trying to take off. I'm trying to maintain and grow and, and serve um, and explore. And if you're trying to take off, like it's a new world out there. <laughs> and uh, pay attention to those teenagers because they really know what they're doing. Sounds like TikTok to me. <laughs> Did I imply? <laughs> so Emily, I kind of let you echo her. Like, you know, like again, we don't know when the industry is going to return to normal when people will be able to do shows and tours. So how can creators prepare themselves long-term for virtual success? Yeah, I mean, Julia's right. It's like, you know, it, and like I was saying before, you have to do what you can with what's around you. Um, I, I do think touring is going to return by the end of next year. Um, if to me, like the real music business news is like the in-depth vaccine articles, if you want to understand when concerts will return. Um, but obviously it's going to take a lot of time, you know, for that to get out there and everything. So yeah, it's like, um, but at the same time, like hybrid models, like are clearly emerging. Um, our webcasting partner at iVoted was uh, a new platform called Mandolin. Um, they are partnering with the Ryman, with City Winery, with all these great venues. And I don't mean to be so biased in my iVoted world, because I'm sure concert promoters and artists will do great stuff with this, but like for the 2022 election, that means we can, you know, post vaccine, we can have sold out venues on election night, but then activate that many voters via webcast. So there are going to be some good things and advancements that come out of this. Like um, I was speaking at University of the University of Minnesota Mankato very early in the pandemic in like April. Um, and I want to give Professor Scott Laguerre credit for this heartbreaking and brilliant statement, but he was like, COVID is um, Napster for the live sector of our, of our industry. Um, and as awful as that is, we still have a recorded music industry post Napster, right? So it really is on all of us to, you know, adapt, evolve, iterate, um, actually do all those things and not just have them be buzzwords. I have one more uh, thing. Um, one of my favorite artists that's like growing right now is Remy Wolf. And hmm. she just put on a drive-in show. And I was like, wow, it seems like it's going to be bad and weird. And then she crushed it. <laughs> she was like, she got the cars to honk. She got a, like a flashing light show. She like got on people's hoods. like. There's, there's two ways to interact with struggle always. There's like, feel, feel the pain of it and it's valid. There is pain in, in this pandemic. There is a lot of pain and you can make art out of that pain and you can, on the other side of things, get playful with the options. Restriction, I don't know the exact the saying, but it's like restriction is the breeding ground of creativity. Like having right. too much freedom is al almost a bad thing to try and be creative in. So this is your restriction. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that was a great answer. Um, to keep the conversation going, we're going to kind of go on to the next topic. Um, you know, what can I do to be successful? So um, Julie, I'll let you start because I want to get a creative artist standpoint. And then Emily, actually, Emily, you can answer this first. So obviously we know creators are, you know, by nature, creative, um, influenced by emotions, experiences, connections, right? So right now in the current climate with COVID, um, Emily, from a business managerial standpoint, have you found a way to push that aside and continue to create relationships and work and bring more work to your clients? Yeah, definitely. I, I think we've always been pretty uh, able to adapt and, and kind of looking forward and, and very into technology and, and the future. I'm surprisingly introverted. So this year's been good for me, minus all of the horribleness. It's like, I'm able to just hole up and be an entrepreneur and, and make things. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it depends, but you know, I, God, I met, 
I met my new boyfriend on a, on a video podcast during a pandemic, right? So it's like, you still can connect with people. Um, and, you know, I, and I was thinking about it too. It's like, our I Voted team was over 200 volunteers. Like there are people on that team I've never met in person that I feel like are my sisters, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, you just, you just figure it out. Um, just like we're doing today, all, all hanging out on Zoom. Right. Are there any resources you can give to managers that may be listening to be able to expand upon their relationships or like any apps or anything that you've been doing in particular? I mean, we're doing it. You know, the fact that you have like 130 people here means these webinars have been kicking ass, you know. Um, and I saw that very early on in the pandemic. I was speaking at a student run conference at, at Hofstra and you know, there were students from Connecticut, from California, and they were doing like one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions with panelists. And I'm just like, how do you even know about this conference that, that's not at your school, like across the country or whatever? So there's a ton of great resources, um, you know, or there's a ton of great online events going on. I, again, still really important to take care of yourself physically and mentally. Like we can't just be like staring at the screens all the time. Um, but yeah, and, and also like, I, I've heard this in general, I'm totally seeing it. Like, people are more available, right? So if there is someone, you know, whose brain you want to pick or mm -hmm. someone you want to get advice from, like there's a greater likelihood of them saying yes to a Zoom because everybody's stuck at home right now than if they're traveling or they're running around to meetings or whatever. So there's a ton of access to information right now and, and actually a lot of opportunity. Amazing. And Julia, I'll let you echo her. So you from an artist standpoint, writer standpoint, um, with everything that's going on, how have you been able to push that aside and continue to create relationships, you know, create new music, kind of let you answer that question. Yeah, I'll bring it full circle back to what we were saying about self-care. And mm -hmm. um, for an artist, I think one of the hardest things is that mental block of like, who am I to, to be putting out art? Like, I'm not as talented as the millions of people online who are so, so talented. And um, it can really be a deterrent. It can really stop you in your tracks from even creating of like the judgment that lives inside of you and that you imagine will come at you if you step up and uh, like put yourself out there. So I, I have like the silliest practical tip for this and that is like, watch people who put themselves out there that make you feel good. As a society, we're a little too used to watching someone be like out and proud in a way that we hate. We like watch someone embarrass themselves and that's like a form of entertainment. And that's why it's so hardwired into so many people's brains that like, if I make myself known, I will be taken down. I will be made fun of watch people that you find like to make art watch art that you love that that someone is confident and sometimes even messes up and and makes mistakes and keeps going like i watch videos of donald glover and uh remy wolf is like so charismatic and out and i have so many friends like um my friend tessa violet is one of my like we both came up through YouTube and mm -hmm. she's so um, genuine with how she puts herself out there and and I don't judge her, you know? There's plenty of people that I do judge. I am not a perfect person, but like train, retrain your brain that when you see art and when art is put out, that it's admiration. Like that's my practical advice. Stop watching people that you're cringing at. Hmm. Amazing. And follows what inspires you. That's what it sounds like. Perfect. Um, so the last question before we get into the Q&As, Q uh, we surveyed um, pretty much everyone who registered and asked them, you know, how do they view sustainability? So some answer, you know, being successful, being well known, you know, being famous, and some actually, you know, wanted significant income. So in you guys' opinion, what are some other obtainable goals um, that creators can do to start the path to their sustainability. Um, Julia or Emily, I'll let you kind of start first. Sure. I think, I mean, we've, we've covered most of that, but I think it's really important as artists and entrepreneurs and artists are definitely entrepreneurs that 
you're building, you're building, you're building, you're creating, and it can get really overwhelming. Sometimes you have to stop and look back and be like, wow, look at everything I accomplished over the past month or three months or six months or whatever. Like I have to do that as an entrepreneur, right? Where I just feel like I'm like burrowing in the snow and I'm just like, what am I doing? But then when you pop your head up, it's like, oh, actually we're like two thirds of the way there. We still have another third to go. Um, but yeah, so just being aware of what you, I, I felt that way this week. I Last week, I like feel bad saying this from a mental health standpoint, but last week was the first week I ever took off in my career that wasn't between Christmas and New Year's. So coming back was, was really overwhelming. And I felt bad if I wasn't getting back to people or my schedule was getting overloaded. And it's like, you just have to chill. You're going to get everything done. You might not get everything done today. Um, but again, you can look back and see what you did accomplish and realize like you are on the path. Absolutely. Julie, you have anything you want to kind of add to that? Um, I would say like the most important thing for me recently has been this, this schedule of monthly songs. Mm -hmm. So finding, finding that for yourself, like mm -hmm. if it is, um, I want to make like put, putting goals in place for yourself. I have one friend who um, released a song every single day. And so for like three months he did it and one of them took off and it's mm -hmm. like uh his name is darren 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 on instagram um and like the level that he had to change his perception of like what's an acceptable thing to put out mm -hmm. was he had to like drop it down and be like i just have to get this done and get out of my head and like so that's a goal that's a great goal to set for yourself of like i'm gonna put out a song every single day for 30 days or I'm going to put out a song every month for right. a year or I'm gonna like have it get find your rhythm set that goal and then stick to it absolutely I love it just writing down realistic goals and again sticking to them um I think you know just creating this consistency within your daily day-to-day -day routine um and obviously I think just doing that you'll be able to find success you know long term so um, those were amazing answers to the questions. Um, we kind of want to move into the Q&A just to keep the conversation going. So let's see here. It looks like Sanja, hopefully I'm not barging your name, but she asked, obviously we talked about team being an impo important part earlier, but she asked, who should be a part of your team or network to help creatives maintain career sustainability, whether that's a PR person, manager, who should be a part of, of your team, creative team? I think I, if it's okay that I'm going, yeah, um, I think it, someone that you can communicate clearly with, right. And, and connect with, and, um, that could also be a super motivated young person, right. That was the case with the Dresden dolls and myself. Um, they played at my university, they were a local band on the rise. And so I introduced myself to Amanda Palmer at the merch table. And I said, studying music business, I'm interning here and there. Let me know if you ever need help with anything. And like, that was a really good, the fact that she said, yes, can you come over tomorrow benefited both her band and benefited me as a young industry person. But at the same time, she also told me later that she'd had fans offer to help, um, but they were fans. I was definitely a fan, but she could see I was on a professional track. So my point is a lot of times we have this stereotype in our brain, whether we realize it or not, of like thinking there's gonna be some magical person on the 50th floor that's gonna swoop in and change everything. Um, I think, you know, what we've been talking about today is just clear communication, right? And like being able to communicate about business and these modern topics, being able to communicate emotionally, uh, for us, like emotionally, mentally, spiritually, like making sure we're on the same page. Um, and again, it, it's been interesting talking to other artists on this topic and finding out there is no right answer for everyone, right? Like like I said, like Imogen Heap has her own little DIY insular team. Zoe Keating had a bigger team than I thought. Um, neither have managers. Obviously I have immense respect <laughs> for, for managers. So that's not a diss. So yeah, that, that's why I feel really strongly about like, you know, build all this up you can, and then you can figure out well, first, then you understand it, which is really important. Um, and second, then you can figure out, you know what, I love doing this part, this part is awful, but at least I understand it, you know, so I'm going to find someone else to do that. So yeah, I, I really think it's custom and different to every artist. I know that's probably not a very satisfying answer, though. 
<laughs> no, I think it was amazing. Uh, I think it's very direct and, and, and clear and concise. Um, let's move on to the next one. Julius was for you. I think you have a good answer for this. Um, Brianna asks, as someone who's trying to get their foot in the door in the music business, um, how can I create a career for myself? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say that you're, I would reframe your question. I would ask a different question if I were you. <laughs> um, I would ask like, how do I, how do I find my people on the internet? Hmm. Um, because the music industry, uh, there's kind of like a myth uh, that used to be that you would be performing at an open mic and um, like a, a record label executive would be in the crowd and be like, you, I'm gonna pluck you out of your current situation and make you into something new. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for many, many reasons that's not happening. Um, if it happens at all, it happens when a record executive sees that someone is, has found their people on the internet and is like, let me help you from there. Let me expand what you have access to because clearly uh, the term proof of concept from business school comes into play. It's like, you have to prove the concept of, of your art being something that people want, which is like the dry business version of thinking about it. But for you as an artist, um, how do you find your people? And it's, um, it's like I was saying, just be as, as actually strange as you are. It's a guarantee you're weirder than you're putting out there right now. And so am I, <laughs> you just have to get more and more comfortable being who you are and then your people will come out of the woodwork. Amazing. And I tell my artists that I'm managing now, it's just, I'm very big on numbers. So follow the data, you know, the music will, will definitely speak for itself. So, you know, if you are seeing your fans um, gravitate to a certain music that you're putting out. Um, also, even if, you know, you look into your Apple Music for Artists or Spotify numbers, uh, cater to your crowd. So, you know, if you have a crowd that's in, forming in New York, you know, you know, right now, I would say pay attention to that crowd and kind of build that out first, you know, before you start to try to, you know, build a fan base somewhere. So follow the numbers and numbers will kind of tell you everything that you'll need to know um, from an artist creative standpoint. Uh, the last question before we kind of get out of here, I think it's a really good question um, from Quentin here. He asks, how much do you think industries like sync licensing contribute to uh, sustainability for music, for artists, producers, or creators? Sync licensing? Yep. It does. How do those industries, you know, kind of contribute to it? Do you, or do they? Um, it kind of doesn't uh, because you can't count on that. So on one hand, there are artists who get synced a lot and they can kind of count on that. But um, I have two revenue stream checklists in the book. Um, one are, here are all the revenue streams that you need to be collecting on if you are writing and recording your music. And then I also have bonus revenue stream, uh, a, a bonus revenue stream checklist and sync actually goes on that. Um, because again, it's not anything you can really project or plan on. So when it happens, it's great. If you own um, your master, even better. Um, awesome if you own your publishing too. Uh, you know, depending on the situation, you're probably just going to get cash directly that way. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think sync. I mean, it's again, it's great when it happens. I literally chapter five is like, you know, uh, I have a more clever title, but it's something about like, don't fear music publishing uh, and, and how to land a sync placement, which is an article. The second half of the title is an article I wrote for Hypebot a few years ago that we still get emails about every day. Like, although you can't guarantee a sync placement, there are a variety of things you can do to put yourself in a better position. Um, I just wanted to add on the, I, I know we're basically out of time, but about the aspiring industry person. Um, again, not trying to sell books, but I do have a book out called Interning 101 that basically covers that. But also like, I hear this question a lot from people and it's like, go work with an artist. There's an infinite amount of artists like creating things that, that need help. So this is not, this wasn't quite the question, but a lot of times I hear like, where are job opportunities or where are growth or what? It's like, always go to artists, always start with artists. Like, you know, that's why we're here. And if we have time, I would be really curious to hear Julia's answer about assembling a team because 
you have had like the full on industry team. You have had like, if you're comfortable talking about this stuff or not, you have had like people in your personal life helping you out. And now I feel like it's like, you can kind of choose those pieces a little bit. So you might actually have a little more insight on that than, than I do. Yeah, you wanna cover that real quick before we get out? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, this is this is actually the thing I wanted to say is, and, and Emily just kind of touched on why. Um, be always engaged. So you can hire people, totally hire people, stay engaged. You can't, you can't just like hire a manager and then never talk to them. Hmm. And, I, and I think that that's a mistake that I made when I was young because I didn't, like I was saying, like this stuff stresses me out so bad that I, I just couldn't stay engaged with the business side of my team and you, that's why the person in question is so important. Like Emily is so, um, like she gives me a good schedule. She lets me have space if I need space. She never makes me feel bad for it. I've been in relationships with managers where um, it just got really, really stressful and everyone was dissatisfied and like I had a part in that. So stay leaned in, talk to your accountant, talk to your lawyer, talk to your marketing person. Don't just expect someone to like do your, your um, Hollywood version of what you think their job is. Absolutely. Collaborate. Absolutely. And just to, I, I tell my producers that all the time, it's like, never put your career, your whole career in someone else's hand right? You'll walk in billboard, you'll walk in business. So you need to be in tune with every single thing you have going on. Like you just say, speak to your lawyer when it's contracts involved, speak to your manager, speak to everyone on your team and just don't assume um, that everything is going to be taken care of because when something happens and it goes wrong and you're looking at them, you know, a certain type of way when you could have been more involved in those situations. So definitely take your career into your own hands. Know that you're a walking business, um, you know, and you're a brand and you should kind of carry yourself in such matter. And don't feel bad if you have to ask again. Um, again, probably in my younger manager days, I remember saying to my attorney, like, gosh, I, I, I feel like I keep explaining this stuff over and over. My client, <laughs> she's like, and you're going to have to keep explaining it over and over and over again. So again, like we said, unfortunately, this industry was set up decades ago to confuse artists. So don't feel bad if we you know, if, if you have to ask again, like, what's the master recording side? What's the publishing side? You know, like that, that's what we're here for. And there, there are so many great resources, you know, free resources like this and, and all over the internet to, to reference and learn this stuff. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you ladies so much for this conversation. Uh, we're going to kind of move into um, the next topic. Um, Emily, um, kind of want you to kind of go into your book um, talk about I voted collective ENT and kind of what you got going on some people that you know that's out there that haven't may not heard about you oh thank you yeah I mean we covered most of this stuff um, at collective we do management and consulting and music and sports um, I voted turned out to be the largest digital concert in history all in support of voter turnout um, as mentioned breaking news we haven't announced this yet but our team has rallied me to do it again for January 5th um, for the special election uh for the Senate elections in, uh, in Georgia. Um, and yeah, and this is my second book. Um, I'm super proud of it. Um, I will add that it came out March 5th of this year. So not the best time for any sort of release date, but it, it has become a number one Amazon bestseller. I, I had like no help in putting this out. And I'm saying this because like, it's just been spreading, you know, like, which is what we're, and not that music's just going to spread, right? But like, I take my own advice in spreading the word on this book. Like, I get back to all of you, right? Like, I say yes to things like this that I'm asked to do. I mean, this, this is awesome, you know, but it's like, if it's like Julia saying, it's like, I engage with everybody who's engaging with me along the way. And that's continued to spread the word on this. And, and that's, that's what the book is all about, you know, doing the same thing for your career. Amazing. And we will also have a link for you guys who are tuned in um, for you to guys be able to digitally buy the book online. Um, so definitely uh, stay tuned for that. And we're going to move it over to Julia, um, kind of let the audience know what you've been working on, how they can kind of follow your music and everything else. Nice. Yo, thank you. Um, yeah, you guys have heard about my, my year of um, videos and oh my gosh, my so sorry. 
Um, well, yeah, I'm a musician that uh, is gonna turn off her phone. <laughs> I've seen so many parents call people on Zooms. <laughs> like they know you're on Zoom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I will be on um, on Instagram and uh, Spotify. And in 2021, I'm going to be releasing a song a month as well. Uh, acoustic versions of the songs that I put out in 2020. So keep an eye out. Uh, we have their Instagrams listed. You can follow them. You can follow me. Um, you know, DM them if you have any other questions, if you wanted to reach out to them. Um, you also have Julia's Twitter information as well. So again, thank you ladies so much. I enjoyed the conversation. Um, I think people will walk away, you know, uh, with how to respond in this virtual world right now due to COVID and how to be sustainable. Again, go out and get Emily's book. Um, definitely a great read. And I just want to thank you guys. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say to the people before we get out of here? Yes, minor typo on my social handle. There's no H, but I just wrote that in the chat. <laughs> no H, just yes. EM Wizzle. <laughs> yeah, but this was awesome, Woo. Thank you so much for having us. This was amazing. Thank you. You ladies were amazing. I look forward to talking to you. And uh, thank, you, every, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And again, uh, so thank you so much. You guys enjoy your weekend, and we will definitely be in contact. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks, right. everyone. Have a thank great you. night. Yeah, have a good one. Bye, guys.